everyone. Um, just before we start, just let you know, we unfortunately weren't able to set this call up as a webinar. So you will be able to see all the participants, you'll be able to unmute yourself, um, turn on your video. Um, but please, can you keep yourself muted? <laughs> um, and we don't have a Q&A box like we would have liked to, but we're going to be using the chat function as the Q&A box. Um, so yeah, my name's um, Hajara. Thank you everyone for joining um, this evening for the event on abolition, abolishing surveillance. Um, we'd also be recording today's event. So um, if you don't want to be recorded, please um, turn off your video. And I'll encourage you to use the speaker view on, um, on the top right where it says view and that'll make it easier for you to see um, individuals who are actually speaking rather than um, participant um, so you can enjoy the event better. Um, so yeah, this is part one of our four-part webinar series called Justice Means Everyone, a collaboration between abolitionist futures and Peter Press. This will span four webinars, um, including this one, addressing issues around policing, resistance uh, um, in the broad sense, but also touching on issues that have sometimes been compartmentalized, such as um, counter-terrorism, national security, and inadequacies um, in the rights framework and so on. Like I said, my name's Hajara. I'll be facilitating today's event. I organize with Abolitions Futures, a collaboration of community organizing and activists formed in 2008, who are walking, working together to build a future without prisons, police and punishment. So about today's event, from spy cops to suspicionless border stops, the topic of surveillance is one that has risen to the fore, particularly since the war on terror and the rapid expansion of surveillance state in Britain. But as we know, the history of British um, state surveillance stretches, stretches back decades, and we have seen everything from kids being spied on in nurseries, trade unionists, blacklisted, and undercover officers infiltrating black families campaigning for justice. So in tandem with this, we have seen a political project advanced by Labour, Coalition and the Conservative government alike to hollow out legal protections and undermine the organs of popular democracy, such as trade unions, um, all the way to the third sector, which have traditionally been at the front line of defence against these attacks. So it's in this context we meet today to think of a way ahead, not just thinking about how we can repel or resist individual policies um, in isolation, how we can undermine the logistics um, and the whole logic of surveillance altogether. And it's on that note, um, we are very lucky to be joined today by our four speakers who have organized in a range of arenas. We have Evelyn, Evelyn Lubbers from Undercover Research Group, which is a part of a network of campaigning groups standing against historic surveillance and infiltration of activist groups by undercover spy cops, which is currently undergoing a public inquiry. We also have Mini Rahman from Joint Council for the Welfare uh, of Immigrants. I think, for instance, in my talk, I'm probably going to speak about getting um, uh, raided by the police this summer. Uh, sorry, can I just remind speak, um, everyone to go on mute? Um, sorry, I know it's a bit difficult when you kind of forget, but um, yeah, I'll make it easy for everyone. Um, we have Mini Rahman from Joint Council for Welfare of Immigrants, an independent national charity which works to organize unjust and discriminatory laws and practices that restrict migrants' risk, rights um, and seeks to influence the debate on migration while fighting against the politics of hate and fear. Um, Artem Qureshi from CAGE, which is an advocacy organization initially formed to campaign against Guantanamo Bay um, detention facility, but today organizes around various policies, practices and laws that are justified um, as part of the so-called war on terror. And last but not least, we have jo Joanna Kellett Wright from Docs Not Cops, which is a campaign um, group for the NHS professionals and patients campaigning against the hostile environment policies in the NHS um, and for the scrapping of ID checks and surges in healthcare services. That's all our speakers. Um, we'll start with a short introduction from each of our speakers. Um, we'll then have a cross panel discussion and um, we will have some time for questions from the audience. And like I said, unfortunately, we don't have a Q&A box, so please use the chat box um, and I'll try and sprinkle those questions in throughout our discussion. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, Evelyn, do you want to give your introduction? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Uh, hi, I'm Evelyn Lubbers. I'm based in Amsterdam, but I work in the UK with the, I'm one of the founders of the uh, Undercover Research Group. 
Um, I'll do a, a, a quick run through the what we call the spy cops channel uh, because I don't know whether everybody is aware of it. Uh, it started 10 years ago this month with the exposure of Mark Kennedy, who was investigated by his then girlfriend uh, and confronted and he uh, uh, because uh, he wasn't trusted anymore and he admitted that he was an undercover officer who had been living the life of an activist for many years. And this exposure triggered uh, other women who had over decades had similar experiences with uh, relationships with the love of their life who suddenly uh, disappeared uh, in the weirdest circumstances because in fact they were an undercover officer and were uh, pulled from their operation. Um, and the undercover research group was actually set up to collect this uh, experience, the experience of uh, the investigating and what you run into, how you do it, how you deal with paranoid in your group when, when doing that. And by analyzing these stories, we discovered patterns, really a tradecraft of the undercover officers. So we knew by then already that it was more than a few rotten apples, as the police likes to picture it. Uh, you might know uh, the spy cops scandal from from the women who were deceived in relationships, the undercover officers that used the identity of uh, dead children to build their coffee sto cover story, um, the spying on the on the um, Stephen Lawrence campaign and other black family justice campaigns. But the story is much bigger. In fact, what we know now is that uh, groups, mainly on the left, uh, have been spied on for decades, since 1968. Um, and that tells you something about the society we live in. Um, after a lot of pressure, uh, uh, campaigning and stories in the press, Theresa May, when she was a Home Secretary in uh, 2014, announced this uh, official inquiry uh, into undercover policing, um, which was announced. It was announced in 2014. It was uh, set up properly, started in 2015, and only last November did we have the first. Uh, hearings, the public hearings, uh, witness uh, evidence hearings. Um, and we also, this deals with the very first period of this, uh, of this, the, the special units that were set up to, to infiltrate political groups in 1968. Uh, and we finally got some disclosure. We're now working through 5,000 pages of of, of uh, police reports on that infiltrating. And of course, it's difficult to use uh, such an official st state investigating the state's inquiry as uh, your vehicle to campaign. But we see it as a window of opportunity, as one of the few windows of opportunity to get something uh, so, to get to know more about what happened and how, who knew how high up it went. Because we, we, we do think that in order to campaign, you need to know what is going on and you need to be, you have to be able to be very specific uh, on what is wrong. We were of course very disappointed and just when the first hearing started in November, the, the CHIS law, the, the spy cops law, as we call it, was announced and rushed through Parliament because this law is is just allowing everything that is being investigated in this inquiry. So it kind of makes the inquiry a, a bit of a useless uh, exercise um, because the inquiry will not only look officially into the historic uh, failings that were made, but always also make recommendations for the future. And if you have a law like this, it's like, but on the other hand, we think when this inquiry will be finished, which is in about like five years, it will be time for a revision of that law or, or as we hope, the abolishment of that, that law altogether. So what we do, um, what, 
how we see our work is uh, support activists in finding out whether they have been infiltrated and to guide them through the difficult procedures of this inquiry because the police of course is throwing their toys out and, and making it as difficult as possible and, and delay things as, uh, as much as possible. Um, so, um, which, yeah, we're using all the legal help that we can get to bring cases. There's also a cases which we can talk about later in the, uh, uh, for the, um, the breaching of human of uh, Kate Wilson's human rights because um, she was targeted by Mark Kennedy and he uh, had a relationship with her. And the way it looks like there's going to be the loads of information has been disclosed to her, which will be published soonish. Um, so I think these cases offer an opportunity to build pressure uh, through stories in the press to let the public know what has happened. But there's, there's two, two or three more things that I think we need to take in account when talking about abolishing surveillance. The secrecy of these kind of undercover uh, units that operate without any legal framework that only exist to gather intelligence, not even evidence. So their work has never been uh, scrutinized in court because it, it, it's not brought in, it's not tested in the court of law. The secrecy of these units kind of um, uh, encourages mission creep, a widening of the, of the target groups. And it's that is that is inherent of this secrecy, you know, over-reporting, sort of self-fulfilling perspective, self-confirming that they're doing very important work. And when they start on one group on animal rights, they soon uh, broaden out into environmental groups, into uh, uh, power campaigning, power uh, uh, oil campaigners, anything. Um, and this inc so they they kind of decide for themselves what is considered a danger to society, and uh, the, they decide for themselves which groups they think undermine uh, the democracy or or endanger maybe the reputation of the police in the case of the Stephen Lawrence. So. And the cover policing is by its very nature secret. So you, you can't, there's no solution of in demanding transparency or accountability. It just can't exist uh, with, with that. And the other final remark is linked to the careers of officers that have been <laughs> in, um, uh, in undercover operations or overseeing them. It's very important uh, to us to follow their careers and to see where they landed because what we found is that, that there is a direct line from uh, officers that made a career for on undercover policing to developing prevent uh, it's exactly the same it's the same ideas uh, collect intelligence on groups you see as a danger to society and try to undermine them i can give examples of of uh, of people so and the other thing is that often police officers um, have uh, an early retirement or they they move over to corporations where they start to work for power companies, in, uh, for instance, with all their knowledge about air environmental campaigners, about groups that might uh, start campaigns against them. And there is a very close cooperation uh, between uh, the police, MI5, uh, and those and the, the people who work in security who work in for those corporations or have started their own sort of corporate or private intelligence company so if we we shouldn't only look at the state when it comes to surveillance but we should also very much look at uh, the, the outsourcing of this kind of work and the private company how large corporations but also private intelligence companies 
uh, work on this front. And then uh, as a last thing, you need, if, if we're talking about the abolition of surveillance, we need to know who in, is involved in this and what their politics are. Um, so we need to look at what are the links be between secrecy and power and resistance because um, surveillance takes place in a, co in, a, in a capitalist context. So economics, economic rights prevail over human rights and, and the right to resist. I think this is a very th important thing to take into account. That was it, thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. Um, some really important points that you just touched upon, um, even in one or two lines, we can have whole discussions about them. Um, for me, what stood out was about like who gets inside who is a danger to society. Um, and I hope that's something we can touch upon later um, in the discussions. Um, I'll now pass over to Mini Rahman for her introduction. Thanks. Hi, everyone. Um, my name's Mini. I work for an organization called the Joint Council for the Welfare of Immigrants. So we're a migrants' rights organization that's existed since the 60s. Um, we provide immigration advice to all sorts of migrants. So that could be asylum seekers or people who've been undocumented for a really long time, children in care, so a whole variety of people. And we use the experiences of our clients and the communities affected to inform our, our policy and campaigning work. Um, so we're, we were one of the first organisations to oppose in 2012 uh, Theresa May's hostile environment, which I'm sure many of you will have heard of, um, but it's the system that, that trapped the Windrush generation and it's the system that essentially outsourced border enforcement to all kinds of um, different members of the public and public servants, so that doctors, landlords, teachers, employers. Um, and it meant that people had to prove they had the right to be in the country or the right kind of visa before they could access basic public services, um, you know, driving licenses, bank accounts, employment, welfare, any of the things that, that someone might need. Um, but one of the, the lesser known things that is talked about is the way that the Home Office enforces that system. And that largely relies on a series of, of very shadowy data sharing agreements with different government departments and, and different agencies and in the majority conflating policing with immigration enforcement. Um, so I think you'll hear a little bit more about this aspect um, later on, but you get all kinds of things happening, like people accessing medical care and having their data shared with the Home Office, who then use it to try and deport them. We've seen that happen with clients um, fairly regularly. Uh, you have things like victims of domestic violence or other victims of, of criminal activity who call uh, the police for assistance and end up being arrested themselves because the police share their data with immigration enforcement. Um, who then decide they don't have the right to be in the country. It, you know, this method of, of data sharing and surveillance has meant that it, it stops people from accessing services when they try to, but it also stops them from act interacting with them at all because they're too afraid that they will be um, arrested or deported. So you have that aspect of data sharing that that is kind of basic practice for the daily function of the Home Office in, in relation to um, immigration. And that is supported by all kinds of internal technology and digital monitoring. And this is a pattern that the government is increasingly moving towards um, more digitalization, uh, more online systems for applications, more algorithms which make decisions on without kind of human interaction um, and means that they'll have more readily available information about migrants just, you know, at their fingertips. Um, and I think it's really important to say that, you know, the Home Office, in terms of their history, particularly in relationship to, to migration, is notoriously bad at IT systems. It's notoriously bad at keeping people's physical data as well as their online data. They're really bad at respecting privacy. There's no transparency. Um, for the general public, it's incredibly hard to get any information out of them without sort of legal representation. So for migrants themselves to understand what is happening to them is, is really quite difficult. So you have that kind of initial aspect of, of surveillance that goes on. But on, on top of that, <clears throat> the Home Office has 
really wide and broad surveillance capabilities, which are which are quite on par with other aspects of, of surveillance, but specifically for migrant and border technology. Um, the hostile environment set the groundwork for that for that frame, but it's been extended massively over over the last ten years, and uh, this includes outsourcing to, to arms and surveillance companies, many of whom are already involved in kind of international surveillance and various breaches of human rights. It's kind of one of those things where you name them, they've got a contract with the Home Office in some kind of border technology. Um, so I touched kind of briefly on the intersection between migration and policing and how that's becoming more digitalized and increasing immigration enforcement surveillance powers. And so I'll just go into a couple of examples of how that that is used. So you have the police and immigration enforcement using things like fingerprint scanners and trialing facial recognition in, in public arenas. Um, you obviously have facial recognition and fingerprinting at border control, too. Um, you have people needing to have their biometric data recorded in order to prove they have the right to be in the country. Um, people have something called biometric residence permits. Those permits in, include DNA profiling. Um, the Home Office is moving to put that all together onto one giant IT system, which will be used to track people throughout the system from the point of entry to the UK and making their data more available to, to more agencies and more departments. But the Home Office themselves says the point of this is to, to share an, immigration, an individual's immigration status in real time with authorised users, um, providing proof of entitlement to a range of services such as work, healthcare and benefits. So you can see how that intersects with the, the point of the hostile environment and how they've extended on it. And then for a couple of, for a couple of groups of migrants, this, the impact is on top of that. There are other surveillance aspects that, that also intersect with their daily lives. So the Home Office uses surveillance and its monitoring of asylum seekers uh, quite heavily and in quite a, a abhorrent manner. Um, they can access mobile phone records through various agreements with third parties. Uh, they use that to prove or discredit people's journeys to the UK, to use that as rationale to send them to other countries. Um, to, to disregard the UK, UK's responsibilities to take on asylum seekers. And when someone has entered into the asylum system and is making an application, they are surveilled through the, the resources that the Home Office provides for them. Um, for example, there's something called an, an Aspen card, which is a front-loaded sort of debit card with a small sum of money that asylum seekers can use in, in certain shops or certain places. Not everyone can withdraw cash from that card. Uh, it depends entirely on your circumstances. But the Home Office again monitors spending and location um, used on that card and uses that to question your individual circumstances and whether or not you need Home Office support anymore. So there's been instances of people um, making a regular train journey to see a family member or a friend and the Home Office using that as rationale to say they have an extended support network that they can live with instead of being in Home Office accommodation and being provided asylum support. Um, and then the final aspect that I just want to touch on, which I think is really important and, and is definitely an area of work which will increase over the next few years, um, but I think it's really important to point towards the increasing uh, technology and surveillance capabilities in places like the channel or, or uh, points of border entry, um, which are where people enter at high risk of, of smuggling and, and trafficking. Um, I think the events of sort of last summer where we saw a, um, some people trying to cross the channel, saw an increased amount of death in the channel. We had uh, the now Home Secretary Priti Patel talking about all kinds of bizarre things in relation to how we police um, that small that small entry point. You know, she talked about things like using jet skis to push people back to France or, or even more bizarre things like inserting wave machines. But those are really big distraction from the, the very real technologies that they are using already in the channel. Um, Border Force and other authorities, plus several private companies, provide a lot of, of technology at those points to monitor what's happening. They're, they're particularly drone heavy. Um, people have basically or virtually no rights um, whilst they're making that crossing. We currently have a client and we know of at least 11 people who have been charged with a kind of smuggling offence 
um, because they were caught on drone footage sitting near the steering wheel of a boat whilst crossing the channel. All of them are asylum seekers. Uh, it's the kind of, while well, we've caught them steering near, sitting near the, the head of the boat, which means that they are a people smuggler and not an asylum seeker, and therefore we will criminalise them. And those people have virtually no rights because they've not even entered the system as an asylum seeker yet. Um, so I think you can see that there's there's a really massive range of ways that the Home Office uh, surveils migrant communities um, and the same kind of things that apply to, to, to people of British people of colour more generally applies to those communities and increases uh, the racial discrimination in society in general. Um, but it, it kind of feels even more detrimental because a lot of the people that this is applying to either don't have access to the, to the rights and support that they could have because of the hostile environment in the first place um, or simply just don't have recourse to, to legal advice or to the to the people that might be able to find out this information um, so I think I think I'll leave it there and then we can probably talk about some more things in the discussion thanks Minnie um, yeah the stuff you just ended with there was so horrific to hear like even though you know these are the kind of things that they'll do and it's not surprising just hearing about it um, yeah it's very horrific and like how you touched upon just how widespread the tentacles of the police is it's not just policing or you're breaking this law that law is going everywhere um and i'm sure all of our speakers will touch upon that as well and we'll touch upon it in the discussions too um i'll pass over to asim now for his introduction thank you hydra and, and thank you to everybody abolition abolitionist futures it's a uh, it's a great honor to be on this panel and to have a chance to kind of share some of our experience. So yeah, my name is Asim Qureshi. I'm uh, the research director at the advocacy organization CAGE. Um, as Hydra mentioned at the start, you know, we really started off kind of focusing on casework in Guantanamo Bay, but really as we saw the war on, uh, on terror develop through a network of secret prisons around the world, um, through to counterterrorism legislation becoming ubiquitous in almost every country uh, across the globe. Uh, we felt it was important that we looked at the way in which the rule of law was being systematically eroded through um, the excuse of national security um, and the embedding of um, extremely draconian policies around the world. Countries, they really have a best practice of um, these, uh, this type of legislation, this policy making. And so what we see taking place in say, for example, Australia in a specific period or in Canada in a specific period, or even the UK, it ends up translating uh, into different contexts. So you find that your, that same policy and the people who made that policy will be consulting in the UAE, for example, and even harsher, more draconian measures will be adopted there than say, for example, uh, we have uh, over here. So there are, of course, a number of problems that are associated with that. I mean, but I think, Minnie and Evelyn have done a really good job of setting the, the stage for us in terms of the, the the kind of the width of this. So I want to actually bring it a little bit more narrow and focus on the human impact uh, of surveillance, because sometimes we can get drawn into a conversation around um, how society at large might be affected by these policies but we forget that ultimately it's human beings who are uh, subject to this and their experience is so important and there's two policies that i'm, I'm going to focus on uh, the, the short uh, intervention at the start the first one is uh, schedule seven of the terrorism act 2000. now this is a uh, a piece of legislation that allowed initially when it was brought in for the police to detain you at any port coming in or out of the country for up to nine hours without uh, any legal representation when it was initially brought in that's changed somewhat now it's still very very draconian but it, it, it's really interesting this piece of legislation i could go outside right my outside of my house right now uh you know find somebody in the street kill them and i have more rights than i do coming through a port I would have the right to a silence, for example. Coming in and out of a port, though, I have no right to that silence. It is a terrorist offence for you to refuse to answer a question 
at a port, uh, at a border stop under Schedule 7 of the Terrorism Act. And what we're talking about here is tens of thousands of people each year who are stopped. Now, um, some people will say, actually, well, the numbers have significantly dropped. Well, they've dropped because they changed the, the markers of when they actually log a, a stop. So now anything shorter than an hour, they don't log anymore. And so this claim that the numbers have reduced in terms of the number of people being stopped are, um, are skewed by that, by that fact. But that aside, you know, what you have is a scenario where you are asked about every single aspect of your life. You are asked about your political opinions. You are asked questions like, which mosque do you pray, pray at? Um, to what extent do you consider yourself religious? I mean, these are questions that I've been asked to myself. And I know many other people have too, like the famous actor Riz, uh, Riz Ahmed, he writes very eloquently in the collection, The Good Immigrant, about his experience at a border stop. And it, uh, ultimately, it, it, it comes to no one is escapes um, Asim, you have I think to understand that so um Asim, do you mind repeating just the last line um, you said sorry I, I oh my internet connection's gone a little bit unstable for um, just so after um, you spoke about what I was to be saying is that uh, yeah, I was just saying that, you know, what we need to understand is what the purpose of this legislation is. Sorry, thank you. Um, and it is to stop to stop somebody in order for the police to question whether or not someone is involved in the preparation, instigation or commission of an act of terrorism. Right. That is the, the function of the legislation when they stop you. And so when you get into that room and they ask you, how religious do you think you are? Right. My response is somebody who who understands what's going on in this situation and how utterly racist it is, is to ask, well, why do you think that question is so important to figuring out whether or not I'm involved in the commission preparation or instigation of active terrorism? And of course, then they start getting flustered because the only answer to that is, well, because we think Muslims are terrorists. Right. Like literally, that is like the only place that they can go to. Yeah. Um, and and that is what is going on in this room. They are trying to capture data in the tens of thousands of people who are being stopped. And let's be honest, it's predominantly Muslims who are getting stopped. I don't hear any other community speak about how they routinely feel the intensity of being stopped at a port like Muslims do. Like no, nobody else is regularly making jokes about it, regularly uh, writing about it, changing their travel patterns. You know, before you used to say, okay, get to the airport two or three hours in advance. I regularly hear people saying, we get to the airport, airport five hours in advance in order to make sure that if we do get stopped, we don't miss our flight. Now, this is how the community has internalized the, this draconian policy. We have changed our habits and behavior to normalize a, a piece of legislation that otherizes us that establishes that there is a two-tier system when you go in and out of a port. And I think that's actually part of the tragedy uh, of this piece of legislation. Of course, the other one, um, which Evelyn mentioned earlier is Prevent. When, when Amber Rudd a few years ago, while she was still Home Secretary, was asked about Prevent, she said that it's, it's one of the best tools of information gathering, intelligence gathering that they have. And it was actually probably the most stark uh, 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 admission that we had ever heard because here was the Home Secretary herself finally saying what we had been saying all along about this uh, piece of legislation, that it's not about keeping people safe, that it is entirely about um, surveillance, mass surveillance of the Muslim community predominantly, but also then others as a, by, as a byproduct. And, you know, what's of course particularly interesting about that is that they've recruited the entirety of the public sector to do this. So what, what, what they're asking the public sector to do is to be trained in spotting the signs of radicalization and saying, it's now your job and we can potentially take you to court if you refuse to do your job to report on anyone that you consider to be um, a, a potential risk or potentially at risk. But, you know, that is never separate to the predominant narrative that exists within society about any community. So we're asking people who, who 
take the, the daily mail and the sun very, very seriously in their everyday life to make judgments about people who are vilified, whether they're immigrants, whether they're Muslim, whether they're Roma, whoever it might be, right? But they're being asked to make judgments about those that they are constantly be told to fear and mistrust. So this is a recipe for an absolute disaster when it comes to um, the Muslim community in particular. And, you know, I, I, I don't want to speak for too long, so I just want to uh, end this intervention by saying this, that we have normalized all of this so much that when you, when you gather together with friends or family and somebody says something, makes a joke that's even mildly kind of to do with the war on terror in any way, somebody else will say something like, oh, that was just a joke, MI5. Now, these jokes are so common that we've actually forgotten the seriousness of what's going on in the room when that joke is made, which is this that this is normal now. It is normal for us to feel that we are being surveilled. It's normal for us to feel like there are eyes and ears watching us and that, you know, somehow that there is this contestation with the state where the state mistrusts us by virtue of who we are. That should never be normal. And I think that is probably one of the, the greatest tragedies of, um, of where we are in the moment that we're in at now, that we constantly accommodate um, this legislation, these, form, these piece of legislation, these policies. So yeah, I'm definitely gonna end there now, so thank you. Um, I think both you and Asim really did highlight the human impact of all of these surveillance things. It's not just stats or different policies. It has real life impact on real life people. Um, we are coming close to seven. So I do have a couple of questions, but um, whilst we're doing the questions, if anyone does have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll keep an eye out and kind of weed them in so um, we don't run out of time for um, any of the participants to ask any questions as well. Um, but my first question is, um, so we've heard throughout um, your introduction, the running theme between all of these forms of surveillance um, from migrant control all the way to counterterrorism or countering terrorism um, is that they used to justify um, they, they are they are justified by um, in the name of like national security or national goods. So how can we build a project of collective justice that doesn't um, legitimize injustice um, just for the select few? Like how can we build against this narrative? Could you just repeat the question again, please? Yeah, sorry, I realized I lost the bit that I was reading, so that one, that was a bit jumbled. <laughs> I'll repeat it. Um, so often the, the forms of surveillance are um, justified um, using the name of like national security or national good. So how can we kind of feed back on that and build, a, build on a project um, that doesn't leg legitimize this and kind of fights back against that narrative? So we're not trying to save everyone by causing some injustice just to a few. How can we um, kind of counter that narrative? Um, I can I can give it a short answer. I think that um, when it comes to kind of migrants and, and border control, the national security thing and kind of protectionism around border control has been one of the biggest drivers of that. And also, you know, we can all see the political context of of things like Brexit, where that narrative has been so powerful that it, it's contributed to massive societal change over, you know, quite a short period of time. Um, and I think it, it's really difficult to make the, the arguments um, about kind of what border control looks like if it is done in a kind of safe and humane way thinking about the people who are entering and and how they enter and how securitization of the border actually makes things really really unsafe and also um it kind of countering the narrative that we don't have control over our borders when actually as we've all just outlined the home office has massive surveillance capabilities it spends a huge amount of money on border control um comparatively to other areas of spending that challenging that kind of narrative and turning it on his head and saying well actually you do have control over all of these things and, and this is why the situation is the way it is because you have control of these things um it is 
is really hard and, I, and just specifically on migrants I personally feel that that these areas are so siloed stuff on migrants rights and that issue is often treated as completely separate to other areas of, of rights protection and there's not a lot of collaboration between sectors on, on how things could be improved or where the various surveillances are occurring and how they could be counted. You know, there's quite good relationships in terms of NHS charging. Um, you know, there are groups already working on that, but in all of the other areas, they're basically few and far between people who are campaigning or organizing uh, against stuff that affects migrants, but contributes to the, the bigger picture of surveillance. Thank you, Minnie. I don't know if anyone else wanted to jump in. Yeah, I guess um, perhaps a similar answer to Minnie's, but in the context of healthcare, um, kind of the the narrative of, of kind of um, NHS problems and NHS uh, debts and delays is is kind of pushed back on kind of migration and, and over access of, of healthcare service by kind of um, by people coming like health tourism myths and things and just kind of turning that on its head and that you know, the problems because the NHS is because of successive underfunding to the NHS and I think um, we're at a bit of a tipping point at the moment where there's a lot of support for NHS workers and um, the NHS but the times ahead are probably going to be really hard after kind of move on from coronavirus and things. The NHS is going to be in a really bad place and people's care is going to be disrupted. And I think that there's going to come a time when that's going to be turned on to care workers as well. And I think it, it's it's going to it's it's just kind of that that narrative of who's to blame for or because I didn't get my my, my knee replacement or whatever. Um, and I think just to add to this, I'm not sure if this was what your question was getting at because it was so well articulated. Um, but I, but um, just kind of as an example of not perpetuating um, kind of deserving migrant narratives. So, for example, when the health surcharge was scrapped for NHS workers, there was a kind of, I feel like it wasn't publicised enough that that's not really a success to be celebrating it's you know we shouldn't just be celebrating that the surcharge has been scrapped for um healthcare workers in the nhs it should be scrapped for everyone and um, because you're just saying oh well, that's it's fine to come in it's fine you can have free access to healthcare as long as you've got something to in to give us in return um that's all i had to say okay well, maybe i can say something here then um yeah, I think we, 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 we need to be a little bit careful about how we defend our single issues. Um, I, you know, there is, there is a desire to make sure that some of our activism carries on when we are you know, explicitly subject to the violence of the state. And I'm thinking here in particular of some of the narrative points that came out um, over um, the extremism rebellion, um, extinction rebellion um, kind of situation where they were being labeled domestic extremists. And not, of course, from everybody involved with the, uh, uh, with the different chapters, but there was this kind of constant thread, you know, especially on social media of people saying, well, it shouldn't apply to us. These databases shouldn't, shouldn't target us. And, you know, it kind of missed the mark on what needed to be said at that time, which was these databases are, are you know, kind of unconscionable in their very existence. And I think that was quite, um, quite, you know, kind of upsetting at the time to see them not understand and situate, you know, how, you know, black people for, for much longer than, you know, even the existence of the war on terror have been kind of uh, profiled and racialized in so many ways, you know, and have been, Kept on all manner of databases, and of course, then explicitly Muslims within the context of um, you know, kind of post 9 11. So, that was you know, I think that was just uh, emblematic of uh, a wider concern. I remember even when Tony Blair tried to bring in 90 days pre charge detention, like a lot of the centrist NGOs, you know, um, celebrating the fact that it had been reduced from 90 days to 42 days 
when the legislation finally went through. And, you know, the rest of us were like, do you know what it means to be held in 42 days pre-charge detention? Like, you have no life at the end of it. That's it. Like, there's no way you, as a person affected by that, would ever survive in terms of your work, in terms of your life, or anything else. And I think that's, you know, in, in working with one another, we can't, aim for these low hanging fruits of, okay, you know, will my single issue survive this particular uh, draconian piece of legislation? So that's maybe just like uh, a word of warning about how, how we do our activism collectively. Thank you, Asim. Um, Evelyn, I don't know if my um, butchered explanation of the question has stopped you from answering or if you're happy to leave it there and move on. Um, no, I'm just, I'm, uh, yeah. I'm just trying to think uh, what I've got to add. I think uh, uh, what was just said by Sim about um, trying to prevent, to use the word, uh, to be defined as the others, or you know, like we we are the good ones. We are, you know, it, and it that kind of connects to uh, surveillance in general. Like if I've got nothing to hide, I've got nothing to fear, which is just not true and in my context if you see what kind of people have been spied on it's uh, it's it's any group that wanted any change uh, uh, to the the world order or to their street or di their direct environment um, and it's just um, we can't accept to say uh, we uh, we have to keep an eye on you because we don't know you. Uh, someone might radicalize or someone might overstep a law. Sometimes you have to break the law to to create change. And there is there, there should never be a reason to uh, to say well I don't have a reason to fear because if you, if if we all accept uh, all this surveillance and the undercover policing and the spying on on anyone who's not you know stepping in stepping in a uh, line um, that is a very dangerous thing on the other hand I think uh, and I, I that's one of the reasons why I thought it interesting to take part in this it's that it is very difficult um, if you're already overstretched with your own campaign to to work on larger coalitions or to put time and effort into developing a joint strategy and I, yeah it would be good i guess your next question will be about something like that thank you yes yeah thank you um i've just seen in the comments there's a question um from sasha about train, trade unions um, so I'll, I'll kind of include that into my question that I had. Um, given how surveillance is put in place to squash organizing, what tactics have you used in um, building a movement and solidarity without contributing to the sense of like powerlessness and suspicion that it fosters? Um, and if you could also just um, to answer Sasha's question, talk about if any of you have been involved in any trade union work or any other kind of similar work to kind of help build um, solidarity. We're good to touch on those as well. Um, I can say something about that. Um, to start with the trade unions, no, 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 let's not start with trade unions. Um, I think in our work specifically, it is very, it's very difficult to deal with paranoia and with the sort of the very sort of, you know, de develop depressions over this, the fact that you're being on the surveillance or that your best friend might be uh, an undercover officer. Um, I think that uh, what the entire spy cops uh, scandal shows is that by that uh, people by their own with their own investigations and by joining forces by joining their stories and even work uh, uh, it's not just activists it's also their family justice campaigns it's a very broad church of people that have been spied on and that have kept up some kind of umbrella coalition without you know like you have to talk 
to union people, to Trotskyists, to <laughs> all kind of people. And you have, um, you know, to to keep up some kind of coalition to put pressure is very is I think very important. And the other thing with um, uh, union work, of course, part of the uh, spying was done on union work and uh, people have found out that they've been blacklisted and that on the blacklist files there was uh, information that could just come oh, and only come from the police from these special branch units. So uh, indeed it's very important to to campaign on this because th these were you know health health were health and um, the shop stewards that were uh, working on labor condition about dangers on the workplace and they were spied on and some of them uh, were blacklisted and didn't get a job for for ages so it is it is very important to to make this known and to make uh, to realize what power for instance building companies have had in the past to think about how you can join your forces against this. Thank you, Evelyn. Does anyone else want to go next? Uh, yeah, I, I can. Um, I can go next. Um, so, just in terms of kind of organising, I think it's it's kind of it's important to be kind of really honest about the state of. The, the migration sector in terms of campaigning on, on this issue, the reality is, is that there is not a lot of resource, there's not a lot of capacity, there's no big paid NGO working on it. Um, there's very few people even campaigning on a grassroots level on the kind of on the kind of big picture that I'm aware of. More recently, there have been a few research projects um, and things that have gone on. And I think the main way because of the hostile environment, it's really hard to empower people to come forward themselves because they are criminalized. Uh, their existence is criminalized if they are undocumented or have not entered the system. So supporting them to, to do so is, is quite hard unless you go through the kind of legal avenues. So all the work that has been kind of successful in this area to date has been around sort of legal challenges, subject access requests, um, trying to ensure that, that that those things are challenged at that level, you know, that that happened with an algorithm case that JCWI managed to get the Home Office to take down uh, last year. That was through legal work with an organisation called Foxglove. Um, there's an organisation called Privacy International who's increasingly organising around this kind of area of work. And again, with the, the people that I talked about who were captured on drone surveillance, that's um, again going through kind of the legal challenge avenue. So there's definitely scope to kind of broaden out the work and think about how we could all kind of contribute to that. And I just wanted to kind of briefly touch on, on the trade union aspect. Um, Trade unions have a really complex relationship with migrants' rights and with the migrant sector, um, and they historically have not been great at standing up for, for migrants, even when they are legally here and employed and part of their unions, let alone people who are, for example, working in... Um, who are who are doing undocumented work who have no relationship with the union because they cannot unionize because they are criminalized in their existence and there are a few um newer unions like the the iwgb and uh, voice of domestic workers who are doing some really incredible work with uh with migrant communities um and i think it's a really big challenge to get trade unions to talk about the kind of issues that migrant workers or just migrants in general um, are experiencing. And uh, so JCWI has started a, a, new, a new campaign recently um, on work, migrant workers' rights to try and get the bit of the hostile environment that criminalizes migrant work to be decriminalized in essence. And a big stream of that work is trying to um, increase the understanding of trade unions and why this issue is important and how they can uh, relate to it and, and what they should be doing. Um, 
on the ground with union reps as well as holistically as a, as a trade union. So, uh, uh, yeah, I would heavily encourage people to have those conversations if they're part of their unions and uh, or our union reps to to think about how you can actively oppose uh, surveillance or, or monitoring of, of employers. And um, and also, I mean, we didn't talk about it at all, but kind of, you know, there are a lot of employers who um, work very closely with the Home Office to uh, report people who are undocumented, even when they have hired them themselves. Um, and sometimes the Home Office puts together agreements with employers. The famous example is, is Byron Burgers, who um, had a whole number of undocumented people working there, exploited work as well, underpaid. And the Home Office came up with an agreement with Byron Burgers to raid Byron Burgers and arrest those people and deport them. And Byron Burgers avoided uh, being charged or fined or shut down because of the agreement with the Home Office. Um, so yeah, really important for, for unions to think about how they can how they can actively challenge the hostile environment in the day to day and holistically. Thank you, Minnie. Um, I don't know if Asim or John had anything to add. Okay, I, I think I'll just say um, two points. The first one is um, in relation to you know I think like in my work I found the easiest way to to work with others is on single issues to to come together where your your work intersects and you know it's going to have direct relevance because then you feel that investment from the other organizations too I found that generally in our working practice we were able to come together with certain coalitions at certain times to achieve uh, certain things for example on the uh, torture inquiry uh, MI5 and MI6's involvement in, in the torture of many British citizens and residents that, that was quite effective in many ways sometimes it doesn't work as well and um, and I, this will lead into my second point. Um, we, you know, one of my colleagues was arrested uh, under the Schedule Seven of the Terrorism Act 2000. He refused to give the passwords to his device because he had client confidential information on there. And um, when we finally got together a, a joint letter that was supposed to go from privacy organisations um, to uh, parliamentarians, they ended up saying, "Well, we're happy to have." Uh, Mohammed Rabani, who's our managing director, who was arrested, his name on the letter, but not your organization as well. And I think that sometimes the kind of politics of respectability plays into this. They don't, you know, kind of some of the larger NGOs don't want to work with community organizations. And it's quite important that we remember that a lot of these NGOs don't have any grassroots um, uh, work that they do. Like they think about these things at a much you know, kind of a very, very different level. And so that I think inhibits some of our work sometimes. And, and that's really the second point, which is about this politics of respectability. Um, you know, we need to try and avoid that, um, even within the trade unions as well, actually, you know, and this is like, this is a bit of a, a difficult one, because obviously, trade unions want to give advice to, you know, those that they're representing. But I, you know, I saw the shift, say, for example, with the Counterterrorism Act, um, uh, the Counterterrorism Security Act of 2015 before the narrative, especially from the teaching unions was uh, prevent is unconscionable. Uh, we're not advising our teachers to get involved with this at all in any way. And then as soon as that act makes it law, the narrative shifts to we're going to help our teachers understand their obligations under the legislation, right? That is a huge shift. And is an important one for us to recognize because that ultimately undermines the work that uh, campaigning groups and activists have been doing for so long, which is to say that this is unethical, this is unconscionable, teachers should not be playing this role. But because um, the unions felt a, a, a sense of duty towards their teachers over the actual issue itself, it, it created problems. So I think we need to be, be careful about these, these things in, you know, kind of presenting our, ourselves in a coalition. Just looking at the time, I think we have time for just one last question, but if we could keep the replies quite short. Um, so more and more, we've seen the use of private companies for surveillance um, on the rise. Um, and there's many of you have mentioned the relationship between public and private arrangements for policing. How can we strategically push back against the rise of private surveillance without inadvertently like, validating state of surveillance? Thank <laughs> you. 
and give a short short answer. Um, I think there is no easy answer, particularly because the agreements are, or well, the contracts are so shadowy and and that they take place massively behind closed doors. Often, if you try to get any information out of the government, it falls under legislation that it protects business interests, um, and so they they refuse to give a lot of information out. Um, I mean, I think there are lots of avenues for people to to put pressure on private companies that doesn't in in a sort of that there's I would say there's a lot more space for kind of divestment campaigning in the way that occurs in other countries that doesn't massively occur here, but is increasingly starting to happen. And I think there's definitely space for really creative campaigners to think about how they can do that with specific private contractors. I think that's a really good question um i think and it, again i think just going back to what me said it is so shady and it's so hard to get kind of honest answers kind of in terms of some of the examples of the data sharing agreements like for example using experian and um as a credit checking agency to share patients details all of that kind of information was obtained by fois and i guess the kind of the nhs you can submit fois to and, and there's been a lot of people working on that but I think, yeah, just going back to what Winnie said, that is, it's a really, really difficult area. Evelyn, did you want to add to that? To yeah, uh, yeah, I do think, I do think it's very important to expose this kind of relationships. Uh, and that needs a lot of research, which indeed is not easy and is long term work. But I do believe in the um, yeah, sort of in the combination of activist research and campaigning, you uh, you need to have, specifically in this very shady and secret world, you have to have examples and you have to have your facts straight uh, to be able to campaign on this. Uh, and I I do I do think that we need to make more of an effort to to get this on the table or to you know, to expose these kind of things. So invest in research on that. Kathleen, I don't know if you wanted to add anything. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, ultimately that the distinction between the private and the public is now so blurred that, you know, ultimately we're, we're always talking about both at exactly the same time. It's, you know, you're, you can't really, you know, disaggregate them um so so easily and so you know obviously those questions should always be asked um of of power really in the way that it's interacting you know with with these private uh, companies because ultimately that's who we can really hold uh, responsible of course you know there, there are, there's a lot of activism that happens against you know private companies we see like obviously with bds um the bds movement you know very very effectively campaigning against private companies but you know, ultimately, you know, in terms of you know who hands these contracts out, really, that's where we need to alert, target a lot of our efforts. But of course, we can do stuff at an individual basis on an individual basis as well. So I, you know, I think we do need to include um, incorporate more literacy in our organisations about the way in which we use simple things like our mobile phones. That, that you know, there's just one simple and key principle, which is drive up the cost of surveillance as much as possible in your personal life force them to make a determination about whether or not spending hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, on surveilling you is, is a worthwhile uh, activity for them. When your password is password, that requires nothing on that, on, on, you know, by them in order to, to surveil your, your information, your data and whatever, right? That's like you practically giving the keys to the kingdom and say, here, take everything. Like I've, I've got no concerns about anything whatsoever. As soon as you start complicating your passwords, even a little bit, including a number here, including capitals and uh, a character, we're, we're talking about the cost of surveillance being driven up massively. You signal instead of um, other um, forms of communication. All of these things, they help because what we're trying to do is trying to make you know, the, the organizations and entities that are surveilling us make determinations ultimately i mean I'm, I'm talking more about policing than anything else make actual determinations about whether or not it's worthwhile 
um, being involved in in trying to uh, police you as an individual. And ultimately, that that's that's what it's about. Like they're going to say that well, we need to kind of keep an eye out for criminals and whatever. Well, you know, we know we're not. And so, if you really want to surveil us, then you're going to have to spend the money to do it because we're going to make it easy for you. Thank you, Asim. I feel kind of called out there. I did actually have my password as password when I was younger, but I've moved on. I've got better now. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so much has been covered today. Um, and I feel that we've gone on for ages and we didn't get to some of the other questions that were um, submitted in the comments. So, apologies for that. Um, but I don't want to delay anyone's dinner, so I will close up now. Um, just to let everyone know and remind everyone that this is just one event of a series of events that we have. And our next event is next Wednesday, Criminalization or Solidarity. Um, you can register on Eventbrite if you haven't already. Um, and yeah, I hope we can see all of you there. Um, just in the last few minutes as well, I wanted to remind everyone that um, Tutor Books are offering 30% um, discount on their books if you use AF30. Um, and I also wanted to suggest um, um, make it like a suggestion and invite our speakers to make a recommendation, be it a article, book or video that um, they might help you, um, might help you kind of continue your understanding and learning in this topic. As my own suggestion, I'll um, encourage you to check out Abolitionist Features website where we do have a load of resources. Um, we've created a reading um, group um, layout with all of these things and even a guide on how to create your own reading group. Um, and this will be the last time I speak. So I also want to thank all of our speakers. Thank you so much for um, taking the time out this evening to speak today. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I'll pass over to Asim, just because you're the person I can see <laughs> um, to sure. share your recommendations. Um, so there's a couple of uh, books that I can recommend. Uh, one is uh, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism by Shoshana Zuboff which is, uh, it's a bit of a beast of a book, but it's definitely worthwhile uh, going through. Uh, if you want something slightly easier, The Case Against Big Tech by uh, Rana Furuhar. Um, sorry, Don't Be Evil, The Case Against Big Tech by yeah, Rana Furuhar is a, is a good book. There's a, there's a great chapter, um, or a couple of chapters in the book that I just released called I Refuse to Condemn. One chapter by Shaf Chaudhry, which uh, kind of covers um, surveillance and algorithms and even um, Loki's chapter covers uh, a lot about algorithms too as well so that's those two chapters are worth checking out. Um, shall I go next? Yeah I've got well there's this my own book which was published by Pluto which is a secret maneuvers in the dark I'm not sure whether it's sold out uh, it is about corporate and police spying on activists based on case studies where we had to prove that it happened. And this is much newer. This came out last year or the year before, uh, which is actually perfect for for this um, for, for this series also. It's called Activist and the Surveying State, Learning from Repression. It's an edited volume for which I did the final chapter. Uh, on activist research and um, it is a Pluto book as well so uh, I highly recommend it because it's it's from authors all over the world uh, having different perspectives but also aimed at building a movement. Thanks. I guess that um, that just leaves me again I've, I've not written a book either so can't recommend that. Um, but I will just recommend three things. Um, Privacy International has released a, a report either today or yesterday, which covers this exact topic, um, interaction, surveillance and interactions of, of um, the state with the hostile environment and on migrants' rights. So I think that's like a really interesting thing to read if you want more of the policy detail. Um, the organisation Liberty has a guidebook to dismantling the hostile environment, which is uh, lots of actions that you can take in your communities um, and existing campaigns that exist that you can support. Uh, so I would push you towards that as well. And uh, just uh, JCWI also has um, a, a handbook for activists on actions you can take in your communities to stand up against hostile environment and stand up for migrants' rights. So uh, check any of those out and, and support the organisations that are trying really hard to get the hostile environment removed and I, I think that's everyone so you're probably all free to go 
Yes, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, we'll include those links um, when we post up the video as well, so you'll have them. Yeah, thank you everyone. Have a good evening.